And this meeting is called to order. And Suzanne, we'll start with roll call. Thank you. Mayor Levy. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Carr. Here. Council Member Case. Here. Council Member Harvey. Absent. Council Member Lavar. Here. Council Member Sonier. Here. Council Member Sawyer. Here. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. If you'll all join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. We will start this evening with agenda item number three in the Woodland Park RET, RE2 School District update. And fortunate to have Steve Wolf with us tonight. Thanks for being here, sir. Hey, thank you, guys. I sure appreciate the opportunity. The, re the reason we're going to get this baby going, maybe. seeing that you've done that that is that is huge and, and so uh, so thank you I want to share with you a little bit about how, the, how that money was spent and kind of what we're doing with it uh, as we, ready, we get ready to go um, once again thank you guys some of the first thing you'll see staff compensation we have one of the lowest salary schedules uh, staff compensation models around here and we raised it and we're still the lowest uh, around here. And without it, though, we could not have dreamed to be able to put any more money in it. And it's my dream someday that we're able to pay folks enough that they can live up here. Uh, we have people, because of the quality of what we do, we have people drive through three school districts to get to us to be able to uh, um, teach up here, to be able to work up here. And, and we're so proud of that. But um, without you guys jumping in there and helping with this, uh, in our community and being able to take advantage of that sales tax of Dennis coming from Kansas City on vacation to be able to leave money here for that we, we would be in trouble so compensation is the first thing um, the next is safety and security we uh, we invest heavily in that that is something that's so important without this we could not do it we have to hope for the best simple, simple as that um, we invest in, with, with our, in our SROs and security and security devices. We, we did get a big grant to be able to augment that just recently, uh, $334,000 to be able to uh, um, take our security to, a, to another level. But we couldn't even begin to do what we do without this. So thank you uh, for that. Also our facilities and maintenance. You guys have invested a ton of money in our schools. We've got great buildings and uh, they should last a long, long time if we take care of them. But we know upkeep for those that type of building sometimes cost quite a bit of money. For example, last year we had this wonderful middle school. Love that middle school. But we discovered that it would work better if the rain didn't come down through the roof. And so what we did was we, we fixed the roof. And fixing a roof isn't like fixing a roof at home. That's a $500,000 deal. So we put $500,000 into fixing that roof to make sure we get uh, things going. Those type of things happen, whether it be HVAC or to be flooring. We know we have to do some things with flooring at the middle school. Well, that's a $600,000 proposition. We'll break that up over some years, but, but uh, facilities and maintenance is huge for us. So that's one of the things we spend uh, a lot of this money on. 
Uh, another is technology. Um, you'll notice, uh, uh, you know, we've got to keep that up. We know that our kids, uh, to be literate in today's society, they, get, they have to be able to access, analyze, apply, and create using the tools of the time. And, and the, so those tools of the time change all the time. The tools they're using today aren't the tools they're going to use 10 years from now, but they have to practice that um, critical thinking piece to be able to keep that going. Um, we also spend some of money to keep, uh, you'll notice the COP there, to be able to keep our uh, um, lease payment, our, uh, to keep our bond mill le levy reduced. So we don't have to spend so much on that bond. And we're, we're going to do that for another 16 years uh, is, is what that is going to take. Um, also, an innovative program. We know that if we have to be able to prepare our kids for their future, not our past. If we're, it's, it's like if you're out hunting ducks and you see a duck pond, you shoot where he is now, you're done. You're going to miss every time. You've got to shoot where he's going to be. And that's a real challenge for us to be able to do that for our kids, to be able to prepare them to be able to be critical thinkers, to be able to learn, to learn, to learn continually. And, uh, and that, that's a change of pace on what most of us sat through a classroom uh, in those fine rows. So we, you know, we have to continue to grow as educators and continue to try to prepare our kids for their future. Um, some things that our district here. Oh, here I got it right here. Never mind. Okay, look at look at me. Um, our district, we were very fortunate this last year. Some really cool things happened. We had over four million dollars in scholarships. We had state champions. We are the leading conservation environmental education district in the state of Colorado, and that's Colorado. Um, you know, which is one of the leaders in the nation. So we're real proud of that. We go to uh, the Envirothon every year. We win state every year. Um, our kids try out for the Envirothon team. They don't try out for the football team. They just get on the football team. They have to try out for the Envirothon team. And so we're, we're real pr proud of that. Our music education is just keeps growing, and, and I'm so proud of what they do and the support we have from our community on that as well. Um, the performances that we give, um, you know, all across the district, whether it be in drama, whether it be in music, whether it be in academics, we're just so proud of that. The grants we work on, like I said, we just uh, received a $334,000 grant for security. Um, that's one of the many grants, and also grants that we provide through our foundation. We work hard for our foundation. We just had our foundation dinner uh, to be able to uh, raise money. We do a lot of different things to be able to raise money, to be able to provide sm some of the smaller grants for our, our educators to be some, able to do some different things. And guys, we're state leaders in, in a lot of things. Uh, we had the state science teacher of the year. We're leaders in environmental and conservation education. Guys, uh, you may not realize you got a lot of educators in the district that, are, that you may not know them, but they're known across the nation. And, uh, and so, you know, it's something to be proud of, that we're not only just state leaders, but national leaders in, in a lot of things that we're doing. Um, guys, our mission, you know, we, our mission is simply to embrace a culture where all learners are empowered <coughs> to pursue their intellectual, personal, and collective excellence. That's wonderful, but to me, the heart of what we do is, is, is in our vision. Our vision is this, a place of becoming. We've got to continue our kids. What are they going to become? And as we look at what they're going to become, that's important. But even more important than that is who are they going to become? How are they going to treat their neighbor? How are they going to be involved in their community? Yeah, and, uh, and a lot of that becomes on who they are, a person of integrity, a person uh, that loves their neighbor, a person that lifts other people up beyond just knowing the basics about what's happening in the, in the classroom. So it's something we're really focused on. Guys, we believe that the students are, are at the heart of our actions and decisions. The educators that inspire, and, and I'm telling you, the teachers are the key on this, that they inspire, empower, and connect with students. That connection piece is so important. Uh, we know that uh, a students, we have students that come to school ready to learn. <coughs> And one of the reasons they come is because they're loved and taken care of at home. The kids that are not loved and taken care of at home, they come to school to be loved and taken care of before they can be, before the learning can happen. And, and uh, you know, um, you know, without relationship, it's hard to maximize that, that um, learning possibility. So we really focus on that. Um, relationships are key. They're positive, productive, and collaborative. We work with that um, within our, our, our ranks with one another. We practice that. I was just today at the end of the day with Gateway, a young, little, little guy, a little first grader, missed the bus. And if you stand out and get, anybody here, you know, kids go to Gateway right now? It is phenomenal. And as they, as they leave, as the kid leaving today, uh, was leaving, you could hear from the office, 
Hey, Michael, we love you. That is amazing because um, I know where this kid was going. And, and he didn't hear that a lot. And, and every day, every day, those kids hear that they're loved. And I hear them talking to one another the same way, um, the staff lead. And so that, that's so important. That families and communities partners, we were so fortunate we were able to enjoy that, uh, to be able to have families and communities as partners. You are our partner, and we appreciate that. Also, we got to create those environments that are safe, welcoming, and supportive, and we invest a lot in that. Educator talent is something we're focused on. Um, we, we have uh, really four different um, pillars that we focus on. The educator talent is key. If we don't get amazing in here, it's hard to kick amazing out the doors. And so we really work hard. It, the great thing for me is sometimes you forget where you live. This is wonderful. You know, even if you don't live here, to be able to come here every day, to be able to Woodland Park, this is where I came on vacation every year. And, and to be able to be here continually. And, and so we're able to, to um, recruit great talent here. The, the, the problem is then trying to keep them here and pay them to stay. And, uh, and, and so, you know, it, they discovered that, you know, that, that's beautiful, but it's hard to eat that. And so, you know, to be able to be, uh, keep their salaries up is tough. So we, we're, we work hard on that, but we work really hard on bringing in amazing people to be able to work. You know, for example, uh, I'm going to throw my high school principal under the bus. You, you, may, you may, oh, that's the high school principal, but you may not realize he's one of the top five guys in the nation. He was two-time state principal of the year, Milken National Educator Award winner. He doesn't have a T-shirt that says that, so I have to spout that out and let people know these kind of people that we have that we're bringing in uh, continually to be able to work with our kids, and we're going to keep the, the, that type of uh, person keep coming in and working for our kids. Um, we really focus on academic success, and guys, that's much more than just sending every kid to a four-year university. Um, you know, a lot of times we focus on that, and that's great, but. Uh, Right now, 72% of the jobs are going to require four years, or um, excuse me, going to require more than a high school education. Only 20-some percent of that re will require a four-year degree. And yet, preparing every kid for that would make no sense. We got to help them um, reach their dreams, their potential, uh, their passions, and a lot of that may not lay uh, with a four-year degree. And so, um, you know, we tr we're really starting to focus on some different things with uh, um, our um, CTE programs. Our social emotional growth is something we're dealing with continually. Um, there's so many things that are happening that all of us didn't experience when we were little um, through the internet, through uh, technology, um, that makes it more and more difficult for us to make sure that we, we are uh, top notch in this. We, we want to establish high expectations for behavior to promote a, collect, a culture of collective excellence, but even more than that, we want to really focus on making sure that our people are ready to learn and ready to perform and safe mentally um, as well as they are physically. And so we work, we're working hard at that. That's a real challenge for not just us, but for schools across the nation. Also, the communication piece that we uh, bolster relationships through purposeful communication. We try to get out as much as possible uh, to be around folks in the community. Our administrative team does. Um, our teachers, we try to be involved in the community as much as possible. Uh, that's one way to communicate. But if you can remember when you were communicating, remember how they got information to your parents when you were little in school? How, how they, how'd they do it, Mayor? Send us home with the letter. They sent a letter home, right? And they're cranking it off. You crank it off that letter and you went, you took it, went, oh, it smelled great. And, uh, and you took it home. And, and that was the communication. So today, we've got websites, we've got Facebook, we've got other social media, we've got signs up around. We, uh, we have automatic phone calls that go out and, and, and let people know what, what's happening. Uh, the newspaper does great. We all that, and yet people say, you know, you guys got to improve your communication. And, and you know what? They're right. We're, we're going to get better all the time. But, but you know, the expectation uh, is well beyond that mimeograph sheet that went home. And so we're working hard on that. But, you know, those things also cost a little money, and you guys help take care of those things. So it's something we're, re we're really focused on. You know, we realize that not every child will grow up to be a doctor or a lawyer. But, you know, be able to teach kids that it's cool to work with their hands or work with their heart or work with their, you know, whatever 
it is a gift that they have. Um, that's important. We want to run with their passions as much as we can. You know, most of you guys here, maybe not all of you, but are able to do things that you love and love what you do. And, uh, and so we, you know, that's a dream for us. We want our kids, and if I see, as I see parents out here, your dream is that when you watch them when they get older and they're at work, that you don't know whether they're working or playing, and neither do they. And I got to tell you, even my job, I, I've not worked very many days in my life. This is not work for me. Hanging out with you, I mean, this is great, you know. And, and to some people, this would be the most terrible thing in the world. But, but I love it. And so that's what we want for our kids. We're going to try a lot of different things. Just an example of that is uh, in Kansas, we started this thing called WILD, which is an acronym for who knows. <laughs> we just like the name WILD. And, and, and we know that out in schools, they've got FFA for AG and FCCLA for FACTS and FBLA for business, all those things. But what do they have for getting kids outdoors and engaged in an environment? Look where we live. And so we started these things in Kansas and, uh, about three and a half years ago, uh, about three years and two months ago. And, uh, and by the end of the year, it exploded across the state. And so when I came here, I thought, well, what if we did it? I just happened to mention it at the beginning of the year. And by the end of the week, we had 52 teacher volunteers. And so um, we've taken off with this. We're starting the, uh, some of these uh, clubs and programs and activities. Anything from gardening to fishing to, I don't know, hunting to uh, camping to hiking to mountain biking, all the stuff we do around here, those are things that we want to give our kids because some of your kids get to do that because you do that. But we have a lot of kids that have no one to show them and they don't have the wherewithal to do it. So we want to be able to introduce that and be able to uh, provide those opportunities for, uh, for where we live. We think that makes a difference in the life of a kid. So just an example um, that we, we have out there. Um, I, I want to skip past a slide just once. This question and answer. I want to show you if Amendment 73 were, were approved this last year, it wasn't. But these are things we were looking at. We tried to get a competitive salary. But, but there's a lot of things that we could use. We could use some CNAs around here. That's an easy. My daughter this year, um, the only reason she stayed in Kansas is because she, when she graduates this year, she'll get free tuition, free room and board, and money for her car for as long as she wants to stay in college. We thought that was a good idea. Otherwise, she would love to be here. But while she's there, her senior year, the first semester, she got her CNA. Second semester, she got a CMA, which is called something different in Colorado. It allows her to give medication. She got 15 credit hours um, in college, first semester. She had both, uh, she's finishing her uh, um, college algebra, or history, or language arts, whatever, all those things that she, she's able to get done. That's one of our goals, that we're able to provide that for our kids. Uh, those classes are different than just uh, having an advanced class where if you pass the test, you may be able to uh, get, the, get the score. Um, our cybersecurity, there's over 50,000 jobs available in the front range. It's a little program we could offer in a high school where they can go out and immediately make some pretty good money. Um, and so construction science, guys, we have a real nice wood shop. It's empty. Uh, we've got to fix that. Um, now, the money isn't pouring in for us to do it. We we're trying to get creative and figure out a way to do that. Even with the money that you gave us, we still had to spend into some reserves to be able to get our salaries even close to the point which would be workable for, for, for teachers. And so we spent all morning with administrators, and, and we spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to do this. Who do we, who do we co op with? How do we get Pikes Peak Community College engaged? And if they won't, who else will engage? So those are things that we're working on all the time. Um, so though, I just wanted to throw those out th there to you guys. Much of this would not happen without you and w with your support and what you've done with this. And, and guys, thank you. You're, you're changing lives. You're impacting the world long before <laughs> that will make a difference long after most of us are gone. So we, we really appreciate it. Questions? Shoot, Kelly. I'd like to just remind me what your COPs pay for. Okay, uh, we have some bonds, and what that does, it allows us to, um, to spend some money on that to lower what people have to pay. But what, were the, what was the debt created? I, I, to don't, build I, it to I don't know. Okay, I just don't you remember. Bill? Yeah. Oof. Carol, just give us your name and address where you start, please. I know, that's your team. Carol Green Street, um, 31 Loafers Lane, Woodland Park. Um, yeah. Kelly, hey, Kelly. Yeah. The, what happened is when we came to the voters to ask for them to approve um, the sales tax for us, we took one of our bonds and we were able to um, 
use a certificate of participation to pay for what was remaining on that bond, mm -hmm. then that allowed us to lower the mill rate for the um, for the taxpayers. And so that's what the COP is. It's that bond. Okay. And that COP paid for a building or a debt oh, actually paid yeah. for a building. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. I, that's okay. I'm not sure what that okay. bond was actually for. It may have been the bond that was for the high school when okay. they did the... It the seems like maybe. I just was trying to remember. I would be surprised if it gym. wasn't that. Sally right. thinks it was a middle school gym. But yeah, that's oh, what middle it was. School? Okay. Sorry. It was the one that we could take and, and get our hands around and retire. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody, anybody else have questions I can't answer? Well, I, I got a comment that you may or may not want to comment on, but uh, I'll have one question. Um, first of all, clearly your passion, right, is palpable. <laughs> we can all feel it. And I get to work for you, so I, I get yes. to be in the school, and I get to see what's happening. You have raised the level. You have raised the bar really for all of us, the teachers, the administration, everybody, for the entire school, and I think that's the kind of leadership that we're looking for. So I thank you for that. I always thank the school board for what I think is one of the great appointments that they've made, one of the great hires in a long, long time. So Carol, to you and your staff, thank you. Um, you talk about partners. One of our best partners through the years up until about the last 10 years was the state. Um, give us a sense of where Governor Polis is going and, and what do you think the support is going to be um, relative to the support that we're getting now for the state. Is that going to continue to decline? Do you see any increase in that in the future? Um, because we're concerned about, right, about the sales tax. Yeah, it, one, of, one of the things that I, right now I don't see a huge amount. Though they'll, pro they'll probably try to use whatever the inflation rate is, 2 point some odd percent. Um, they'll try to do that. They might be able to fund, and it's in a bill form, but they have to figure out where the money's coming from, full day kindergarten. Right now, we eat that. We get paid for half a day kindergarten, but we provide full day kindergarten. And so that would add well, about a quarter million dollars that we could be able to do some things with. You know, not close to what we get here to be able to work with. But they, it's some money. We, we're, I'm going to guess that we might get, when everything's said and done, optimistically speaking, 500 to 550 thousand, maybe new dollars. Um, which, like I said, it'd be not even close to be able to uh, do what we do with the uh, the sales tax. And so, um, I think under the political situation they have now with one party, I think there's a little bit of trying to control overreach. Um, and that's maybe some people would say no they aren't at all but I think there is an effort in that way because that that won't stay that way long if there is overreach council so you're seeing you're seeing more of uh, a stabilization in the funding at the state level yeah where but there's for years there was a lot of de decline well there's they're stabilizing us just a little bit lower than where Mississippi is okay. and so that, that, that didn't help a lot. And so they're, they're eventually going to have, you know, with the, with the economy that we have in Colorado, one of the top in the, in the nation, and to fund as a state, you guys have done different. You've, you've pitched in some money with, with sales tax. But to fund as a state, education, a little lower than where Mississippi is, that we're one of the bottom few in the nation, doesn't make sense. And, uh, and so something's going to have to change at some point uh, to be able to do that. Stabilizing, um, it, it's like s stabilizing yourself in poverty. Thank you. You don't? Steve, thank you. Uh, you, you are passionate, for sure. Thanks, um, and, and I did work for you for a while, so thank you. Oh. Um, the concern is, is, is the school district's going to be comfortable with the sales tax. Eventually, there's going to be a point where you're going to need more because the state's not going to help and the sales tax is not going to cover. What's your five, ten year plan to make sure that you don't run out of funds or become comfortable with the sales tax we have? Yeah, you know, we've been pretty careful on, on what we've been able to spend and work on grants. Um, 
there the really is, you know, I don't know how they could get any lower. And so if they do, um, imagine what people that don't have what our sales tax is. And, and, and so uh, as far as five or ten years out, I, I'm, I'm going to optimistically say at some point common sense will prevail. And, and that things that things will change. They're going to have to. The rest of the states are doing it. How could Colorado not uh, to be able to fund education at a, at a level where it's equitable and whether it's adequate? And that that's the the real key: the equity and adequacy. Um, sometimes, you know, equal straight across it is is a little different. If we had the same amount of money is Kim Colorado is the same amount of money as Cherry Creek um, you know it, it's really they're, they're really working hard on that you know we, we've elected those people to come in and help and so we'll see as you guys know we've got a couple um, amendments to the Constitution that, that really get in the way of us trying to do some things I, I understand their intent and I think the intent is good but it but it's starting to have impact on kids and uh, and you guys have helped to try to mitigate some of that with your sales tax, and, and that's why we're here to say thank you. Um, you know, I'm not here to lobby more money for the, for the state because I, I mean, I do that. But uh, as far as five or ten years out, I don't, I don't have anything five or ten years out. I know because um, I, I'm going to have to assume that they're going to do something correct at some point. Yeah, I would hope so too. And, and you mentioned Amendment 70. Yeah, and, and that didn't pass, but that, that's part of life. Some amendments pass, some don't. We, we just have to figure out a way to keep going, and the legislatures have to find a way to make that happen somehow. The, where where it's fair to the to taxpayers, and these guys work hard for the money. We get but it. But you can see where my concern is, is that, that the school gets comfortable with the money coming in. And, and yeah. The state has definitely yeah. not been a, a, uh, a nice player. Right. So I, I can name a lot of other school systems that are that are starving uh, down in Colorado Springs. Uh, we were going to play a soccer team that they actually had to pay for every student the funds because the parents couldn't afford to pay for them. So I see where the trend is going. Yeah. It's not going to get any better. So what is our school system doing so we don't become one of these Colorado Springs schools that that half the kids can't even play a sport. You know, we, we, we will, people, I, I say this often, we put a man on the moon, we can figure this out. And, and, uh, and so, but, but that, that's just a, a, a nice thing to throw out there. The, what the reality is, is you have to find a way. And, and for example, we, we've got to find a way to be able to bring in, we have a lot of, think of the construction jobs and things that are available, uh, and, and they, you know, ask Carl Anderson was last time he tried to find someone that could, you know, show up at work on time, know what a hammer is, and, and pass a drug test. And so we've got to, to work to provide that. We don't have that available. So we've got to figure out a way to make that happen. That's going to take partnerships. It's going to have to take working with our neighbors, with the community colleges, all those things. We have to think outside the box. We have to do something different than we've ever done before. Um, I, I, I'm, I probably won't be the guy that's going to say we're going to deal with a lot less money because, for one, I don't know that they can get much less from the state. Um, and especially under current political, I don't think it will allow to be dropped much more. Um, and if uh, and with, with the sales tax we have here, it would be great at some point. We got funded enough in education, I could come and say, guys, um, Thank you, but you know, we wouldn't need it. That that's that's probably not on on the, the horizon for us. Right. And, and the sales tax will give you another two hundred thousand, maybe a hundred. Oh no, it gives us another couple million. Well, no, every year add on top of that. Yeah. So next year will be two point four, maybe two point six. So you will have that extra revenue coming in to, to plan with. Yeah, and that does. And, we, and we're very careful. If Brian Brian Gustafson is. Our money guy, and, uh, and we split duties tonight. He's he's a Columbine with the parent group, and I'm here. And it's something we look at continually. Uh, we we keep um, looking how much you know. What do we spend out of reserves? What do we not? How do we put that money back in? 
we always try to keep three month uh, uh, three months worth of salary in reserves at all, at all times uh, to be able to make it happen and, and that's been something that's been pretty continual um, today we're looking um, one of our, one of our thoughts is I don't know we used to have those TV ads where we put them off downtown and uh, where we would you know, try to draw people up the hill students up the hill and we started rethinking that we thought you know what Okay, 10 years ago, we had 1,000 more kids, but that was because they were all in these houses, and they graduated, and everybody stayed. And, uh, and so we, we, we gained about the same number of kids that we lose to other districts. That's part of the way Colorado is. But there are other districts, um, one just down the hill, where over half their students come from out of district. It means their taxpayers are building facilities, upkeep of facilities, all those things. For half of the kids weren't even there. I mean, aren't theirs. So we thought, what if we focused on our kids and, uh, and, and really did what we need to do for our kids and, and budget and, and for our kids and be able to uh, um, plan amazing things for our kids. If other people want to come, great. But, I, but I'm not spending $3,000 for a TV ad downtown to try to get some kid to come up the hill when we've got amazing kids right here that I'd rather really keep. And so that that's uh, that that's a, a focus that we want to put put um, that we really, we are putting out there, and we're going to continue to do. We call those things the things we're adding on that we do for kids. Uh, purple cows, you, know, you see regular cow, no big deal. See a purple cow, that's remarkable. And so our challenge is to build remarkable things um, for for our kids, so that when they come through and they look back on on their experience, they go, wow, that that was pretty cool. Steve, thanks very much. Really appreciate you being here, and you know, let us know how we can help, if, if at all. Well, I appreciate. It. You know, I've got a you know, Val and I talked to them, Kelly. We we, you know, we 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 had an opportunity. I love spending time with you guys. So if you get bored, you need coffee. I'm always needing more caffeine. And uh, and uh, you know, people here, I, I just I just love working with you. And thank you for all you do for our kids. This is remarkable. It's a purple cow, and most people don't have. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Okay, we will move on and uh, the Eric V. Dixon Memorial Donation presentation and Dan Williams and company. This you're going to like, folks. Mr. Mayor, sir, Mayor Pro Tem, ladies and gentlemen of the council. City staff, it's our honor to be here tonight. We're here to say thank you. We're here to give you some money. Um, I'd like to introduce the committee behind me and uh, Steve Plute. I apologize tonight he had surgery today, so he's not here. And his wife Kim, you know, was personal friends with Eric, is along with Steve Stores. After the memorial went in, we formed what was called the Sentinel Committee. We had uh, concerns, uh, respectful concerns, that this wouldn't ever happen in the future again, and frankly, that we would need some seed corn for potential. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Before we begin, though, I would like to introduce uh, Steve Stores, who will give a final uh, thank you this evening, both Mark and Elizabeth, and David as well. And then at the end, sir, I want to present you two things to check in uh, a business that gave us some money recently talking about. I'm Dan Williams. I live at 3275 County Road 61, a little ranch outside of Cripple Creek. I command the American Legion here, and I'm a life member of its VFW, and I work for local government. Next week on March 15th, in 1783, George Washington said, my hair has gone gray and my eyes dim in the service of my country. And he did what I'm about to do, he's gonna put his glasses on. I say that not to bring attention to, to me, but as I look around here, everyone is here and Steve was right. What kind of kids will they be? What kind of service will we present? Ladies and gentlemen, you did it right. This community did it right. These folks behind me did it right. He's exactly right. On 25 August last year, in 2018, this community came together like I've never seen. I grew up here as a kid. I was here in the 70s when we had 3,000 people in Taylor County and 1,000 in Woodland Park. We have 25,300 now. And I'll tell you this, on the 25th, there were 600 Vietnam veterans out there. This city came together. Everyone in this room came together, state governors, general officers, all three commissioners. It was I won. It was I won. And very importantly, Eric's mom was here. Uh, you know, you may not know that there's three names on that memorial that have already passed, including my father-in-law, Art Bordich, who is, you know, D, who was our HR person in the county. 
So there are people that live long enough to see us honor them, and I want to thank you. That's why we're here. And so, really briefly, I want to read something to you. This is how, before we had the help of this city, and before we had the help of everyone, this is how we collected about $80,000. And Mark will tell you, and Steve and Elizabeth, these went into every organization, every, I mean, mostly Wooden Park, in the outlying areas of Victor and Cripple Creek. And here's what it said. Your donation makes a difference. Eric B. Dixon was a 1967 Wooden Park High School graduate, Teller County's only casualty of Vietnam War. He was killed in action May 31st, 1968, and in 1978 his memorial fountain was vandalized and removed and replaced with a public toilet. Please help us commission and erect a proper life-size bronze in his honor. This hero deserves better. Thank you, American Legion and, and the others on here. And so that's how we were doing it. And I got to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, we collected $80,000. And then uh, when we looked at it, someone said, these guys behind me were all crying, so I'll just we'll get it out of the way right now. <laughs> uh, then someone said, you know, we ought to recognize not just Eric, but all the Vietnam veterans that ever lived here that moved through here, that in other states now. And so we decided to put those names on the, on the base. That base came to the total sum of $15,000. Well, it's going to take a little longer to get $15,000. This city, Tony Perry, Deb Miller um, with the chamber, lots of folks in this room, every business in this county came together and in all we sat there in after hours and watched $15,000 raised by the city of Wooden Park in one or two hours. Thank you. Thank you. And so when you go out there today, you can see the results of that. And so why are we here tonight? What you don't know is that on the day that we raised all that money and we all came together, that a few anonymous donors came forward that were made anonymous and we received nearly $20,000 after we paid for everything. This is about $57. Well, I'll tell you, if you were in the bar that night, and this, by the way, came from one of your businesses that went out of business, and the guy came to me, you brewery, and he said, hey, i, I got to give this to you. Um, so whether it's five cents a year or a check for $20,000, it's important. And so they gave us that money knowing that we'd already raised it for the future, for the care and preservation of that memorial, flowers, security, whatever we could do for it. God forbid we'd have some more awards and we have to expand Memorial Park. And so the committee came together. We met with your mayor, with your city manager. Thank you both. We did a site visit out here. We thought, what, what can we do? How can we give back to this great city and this county that gave us all this money to help honor one of our own? And we heard about the vandalism. And it's not a secret to this council that we've had some vandalism in the great park. It's a matter of time that vandalism takes the head off of that statue. And it was just nauseating. So this team came together and said, what, what do we do? Do we flip burgers again? Do we go back for another $80,000? something right and so again meeting with your leadership it was decided that we should put security cameras up now security cameras obviously focused on eric dixon but really focused on the whole park you've got a water feature out there that a kid could drown in a rape could happen out there so these these security cameras that thanks to darren very high definition would be used in miles and o's would be useful in law enforcement and it's it's the way we live today we have to do it you've already had it so we've got that some lighting we're respectfully asking as well that we put a small flag pole near the monument so that we can fly the POW flag and the American flag on those occasions. And as you know, a lot of us volunteered and gave money for the benches that are in that park, including the Legion, the VFW, two more of those benches. You may not know, and this is a respectful comment, Vietnam vets are mid-70s today. And so if you go out there, even tonight we're talking about there were vets out there, and, and frankly they're scratching their heads saying, can we sit down? So, so that's all we're asking. So we're really here tonight. Mr. Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, ladies and gentlemen, to give you a check for $19,544.21 and $57. And so almost $20,000. We didn't put any strings on it. We worked out something that will hopefully will be approved by the council to take care of all of your security needs for the greater good. A little bit of lighting, an extra flag to say thank you. Those couple of times a year that we go out there and do it. A couple benches for the guys to sit on and, and, and pray and reflect. Eric's mom is in her 90s, and she comes there regularly as well. And so I'd ask you to consider that. That's our, our humble request and our gift here tonight. From the bottom of our heart, you know, we were given $15,000 from this city and its great leadership and, and its business owners, and we'd like to give it back to you. Thank you. And uh, with that, I'd like to...
because I live in Divide, but I was raised in Willow Park. I went, Eric was in my high school class. We were good friends. So this memorial that we finally got done is a big deal for me personally. And uh, for the people that actually knew Eric, it's really a huge deal. And as Dan said, I was sitting out in my car tonight, waiting, you know, I was there at 630, and I could see clear over the park. And I actually saw people walking up and looking at the memorial in the dark tonight. And every time I've been to the park, people are over looking at the memorial. So it's a, it's something we need so that we can go ponder what it means to go to war, that there's some finality to it for some people to go. We need to remember that. So it's a great, great thing for the park, and uh, I'm really glad we finally got it done. I wanted to thank the city. You know, we dealt with just about every city department there is during the planning phases of this. We, we dealt with Sally and with uh, Cindy and the Parks Department and uh, the uh, ex-city manager whose name was David Buttery, and Darren did a great job of getting the security system ramped up for us. So every encounter that I had with the city department went exactly like it was supposed to. Everybody was on time. Everybody was cordial. People knew what they were talking about. It was refreshing. So your detractors are misinformed, I'll tell you that. This city is working just like it's supposed to. The, the city departments that we worked with were flawless. It, it was a great experience. Thank you very much for letting us get this done finally. We're very proud of it. And let me get the money. Take a picture. No, no. This is good. Thank you very much. $57. Take the fifty-seven dollars. Yeah. No. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I, I just want to say this. You know what? These kinds of things make council, make the city, certainly make the mayor, all of us look good. How's this sound? I got four guys that come to me. I'm sorry. I got four people that come to us and say, "We got twenty thousand dollars. We want to better the security." at uh, a memorial park um, we want some new cameras maybe a flagpole maybe some benches we'll pay for it um, can you help us manage this um, and so you talk about a no-brainer you talk about a great relationship and a great partnership i mean we have it with these guys and honestly this didn't happen as quickly probably as as some would have liked but i think what dan said at the end of the day we got it right we really really did and and we've spent a lot of time laughing and crying and, um, and commiserating and, and celebrating. And uh, it's been great. It's a great community partnership. We're so fortunate to have these folks in our community. And we just thank you because this is, this is great for, for us, for everybody in this room. And it will be great for years and years to come. So thank you very, very much. Appreciate it. Love you, Pat. Love you guys. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. I don't know who I should give this to. <laughs>
Okay, that's two great presentations. We got a third one to come. And I'll turn it over to Darren Tangeman and celebration of 25 years for Cindy Keating. So tonight we have the opportunity to um, recognize Cindy Keating for 25 years with the city of Woodland Park. Um, Cindy's here with us. Cindy is our third longest tenured um, uh, employee with the, with this, I won't name who else has, <laughs> but we, we are, she, she's, she's, uh, she's up there. So I'm going to tell a little bit of history about about Cindy's background with the city and how long she's been here. Um, and then recognize her with some of the longevity um, awards that we give our employees for um, their commitment to the city. Cindy Keating was hired on February 9th, 1814. <laughs> <laughs> um, 1994. She was hired as the public works secretary. After two years at the position, she transferred and became the revenue clerk in the finance office. In 1997, Cindy was hired for, a, for the job as program coordinator for Parks and Recreation, and in 2008, she was promoted to the Parks and Recreation Director, where she still remains. Cindy was, uh, has obtained her certification as, the, uh, as an aquatic facility operator and as a certified Parks and Recreation professional. As Council is aware, Cindy has led the team of two, of two recent high visibility projects the renovation of Memorial Park and the Woodland Park Aquatic Center. Cindy led the team through the design, construction, and now operations of both facilities. Cindy accepted these two large projects eagerly and performed both successfully. The City of Woodland Park and community is forever grateful for Cindy's foresight and leadership with these two projects, which will be enjoyed for many generations to come. Um, the City received some comments from the former City Manager David Buttery um, in regards to um, Cindy's um, commitment to the, the city. He said, I was so proud of Cindy for how she had developed as a leader of her department and how she added to the overall goodness of the city of Woodland Park and the community. I was also thrilled at how she embraced responsibility for the for Memorial Park renovation project and for the Aquatic Center. As a city, we could never capture the amount of lives Cindy Keating has touched here at in our community over the last 25 years through all the various projects offered at the Parks and Recreation Department. It is in the thousands, if not tens of thousands of residents she has touched. As an employee, Cindy did not receive some of the gifts offered by, by city, two city employees for years of longevity because the existence of that program uh, started well after Cindy was hired. Tonight, we'd like to present Cindy with all these gifts of service uh, she would have received over the last 25 years. She'll receive a city fleece. City fleece. She knows. She knows where to get it. Because um, they're. You can get them in the Parks and Rec Department. Um, so that's probably a big one for you. And she will also receive um, awarded incentives for three, five, ten, fifteen, and twenty-five years of service. And for the twenty-five. your 25 years. Cindy, a grateful city, council, and community, thank you for your leadership and dedication for the past 25 years to the city of Woodland Park. Here's to 2000. Darren, may I have a quick minute? I know the whole audience is thinking these beautiful flowers are mine, but they're not. Ryan? for this recognition. Um, you know, it takes a team. It actually takes an army to get everything done that we do around here at the city. It's not myself that does all of this. I got 
two great people behind me, plus we have um, volunteers throughout the whole city that help us get the, these things done. So it's not just me, but I am so blessed to be able to work for the city of Woodland Park. I'm grateful for the opportunities and the challenges that I've had. Um, the opportunities to grow from being the secretary in public works to finance. And then I went, you know, this is what I always say, I went from finance to fun. And that's just the best move that you could possibly make. And so I thank you, council, staff, and the citizens for the opportunities to work here. Thank you. I know you meant to thank your husband and your daughter that are here tonight, so <laughs> I'm going to let you do that. Thank you so much for pointing that out, Mayor Levy. I thought about that after I walked away, and I said, maybe I should scoop back up again. And But you did it for me, so thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Kip, for um, your patience as I work through all these projects. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we'll move on. Um, do we have any additions, deletions, or corrections to the agenda? No, sir. Okay, move on to the consent calendar. Council, you see the consent calendar. Do you want to take anything out, or if you don't, we'll just look and make a motion. Val? I have a question on B. Uh, the uh, parking, we got a, we got a memo that, that explained that uh, Thank you very much for doing that. That's uh, much appreciated. Um, are these existing, uh, one thing I wasn't clear is, are these existing uh, parking spots or ones that were constructed last year or, or to be constructed? So, we, so I can respond to that. The, um, well, so this last year, uh, we budgeted for um, construction of new parking spots to replace existing the existing parking spots that were taken when the Woodland Aquatic Center was built. So the, the, the thought is, is that instead of constructing those at the cost of what we, what we determined um, to be around $100,000, um, that we would um, pay for the existing spots and that they could, because that, that technically that's how the 410 fund would have to be used to, fund, to pay for the existing, the existing spots that we took. Um, from the Woodland Quad Center, so by, by construction there. So we're giving them money and they can construct them or not? That, that's correct. It would absolve us of any future responsibility of having to build those in the future at about uh, $32,500 less than what we would have it would have cost us to construct them. Paul, thank you. Are we talking 10 parking spots? Uh, 40. 24, 24, sorry. OK, thank you. Any other questions? I'm sure that Steve will put this money to great use, too. Good, I'm sure. OK, any other questions on the consent calendar? If not, uh, need a motion to approve the consent calendar. Second. And a second from Mayor Porto Carr. Uh, Suzanne? Yes, Mayor Levy, just for process, allow me to read the consent calendar into the record, please. Thank you. Oh, thank you. The tonight, this evening's consent calendar is the approval of the minutes of the February 17, 2019 council meeting and the contract with um, that's over $50,000 for the school parking lot in the amount of 67500 I have a motion, a second, so let's take a vote. Carr? Yes. Case? No. Harvey? Sorry. She's not here. She's not. LeVar? No. Levy? Yes. Sonier? No. Sawyer? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. 4-2. Are you sure? I got 3-3. Three, 3-3. Three. Three, three. Three, three, tie. Case of a tie vote. We'll go to the next next council meeting. Okay. The tie vote goes to the next council meeting. Is there, I mean, is there anything I can answer? Question? Uh, respond to? 
in regard to this. Um, I mean, if it, this was a commitment, a budget commitment by the city last year to fund $100,000 to build these last year. This is a reduction in that amount by amount of $32,500. So it saves the city that much amount. So I'm not sure where, where the miscommunication is, but I'd love to answer any questions you have about it. I'll Kelly? just make a comment about that. Um, I, my, it's my understanding this was, this was a verbal agreement that was made. Um, and I, I guess I just see a great deal of benefit in the investment the city has made in over $13 million swimming pool that benefits not only the citizens of Willow Park, but also the, the swim team. Um, and so I, I I guess I just have a little bit of trouble understanding why the city owes the school district for parking places when they've received the benefit of the aquatic facility in exchange. So I, I guess that's where I struggle. We had an agreement with them when we took the parking spaces needed to build the pool. So we took a number of parking spaces for them, and this was the understanding that we would replace those parking spaces that we took from them when we needed to, when we needed that land for the pool. Well, okay. if that helps answer your questions or not, it's just all we're trying to do is maintain keep the word of of the district with the school district or city with the school district in returns of um, either building them or, or coming to some agreement to absolve us of that responsibility. Um, so uh, this, again, I would go back to the point that this city council did approve the budget to fund $100,000. So if this is not approved, we would have to go and build those as budgeted for $100,000. So I will say that, that this is that this is uh, a better situation for the city than um, than going and building that, that true cost. I understand. If we don't approve this, the cost to the city is $100,000 and we replace the, the parking spaces. What is the, uh, what's the upside of that? There's not an upside and, and that, I, I think my point is that it just seems to be that. I think it's the replacing of the That was some. I understand. Anything from my fellows? I've said what was on my mind. Um, and I, you know, I'm not. This is long. Name, will you? It was a handshake agreement. So, yes. Well? Um, so. Um, I've heard various stories about this. I don't even know that the um, school needs those slots. Doesn't matter. We have an agreement with the school. No, I just I just wanted to clarify that. Uh, I mean, is there a schedule on doing these things? Uh, or is there any urgency to do them? Well, we can, but I mean, my point is we have an agreement with the school. 
that we have to live up to. Whether it's a handshake agreement or it's a written agreement, we have an agreement. We took their parking spaces to build the pool. I don't see how we can go back on that, and I'd rather not spend $100,000 if we can spend 67500 If we want to put this off until, uh, you know, until Councilman Harvey gets here next week, I mean, that, that's fine, but I just don't see the downside myself. Paul, can you weigh in on this? I just thought there needs to be so many improvements done to that street alongside the school. And we're spending sixty-seven five thousand to go into the school and really not build those spots from what I understand or may think in my mind. And we can use that money for improvements down that street and help with the parking and the drainage and everything else that's going on there. I mean, what you, what you've done now is though is you've actually freed up thirty two thousand five hundred dollars to actually to be able to reallocate to that. So okay. that so, we're so talking twenty four parking spots. We're talking a hundred thousand dollars. We're talking a school that is going to use it elsewhere, which they don't disagree that they do need it. I look at the taxes that we've approved. The people approved in a ballot, and I say. Okay, can we put this money to better use? Also, we've been hit with unexpected expenses. And are we going to need this money somewhere else? This funding could not be used for anything but for, ten, for roads. So it could not be used for that expense. For 10. For 10. Nah, I'm not a four. So what is the process now? Um, can, we, can we take another roll call on a vote after this? I think the rule is you have to go to the next meeting. We do, and what wow. I need, what I, excuse me, what I need to do is, um, so that means then the minutes are not approved either. So I just want council to note that, being we did the consent calendar as one, both items have not been approved. And that that shouldn't hold us back. Paul, well, I'm going to change my vote if that's appropriate. I think that's what Kelly asked, and I'm not sure we can do that. Jason, do you have any? Thank you. <laughs> Jason. Jason, welcome to Woodland Park. You just yeah. said that. Um, you know, let, oh wait, let's see, Sally's reminded me, we do have a legal opinion in here. Let me just, thanks Sally. I, I would imagine that you could have a, while you're still here at the same meeting, a motion to reconsider the item. It's still on the agenda, but I would defer, I, I'm not familiar enough with our, having been here four days. So here's our resolution, Jason, and the green highlight is um, referring to the tie vote. I was just going to say, I had no idea other people would vote no. I was voting no out of a principle with myself. Having the legal background, 
I think that it's dangerous territory for the city to do handshake agreements that uh, include money. And I get a little frustrated with saying, well, it has to be now or it'll go back to 100,000. But mm -hmm. it was a handshake agreement, so who says it has to go back to 100,000? So for me, that's why I voted no. I just, I don't agree with handshake deals when it's contractual like this, it has money obligated. And if it can be done at a discount now, and it was only a handshake agreement, then to me there's no reason that it would have to go back to 100,000. I also don't know how each individual parking place was evaluated, um, and they could be you know, decreased from X amount to this amount. And, and I appreciate that you did that, it, that's awesome. But I had no idea other people would vote no, so. Well, I can, uh, if, if you can, we did do it. A lot of the Public Works Department who did the cost estimate tell you why it was at 100. The, the issue, I go back to the point, is that this was budgeted based on the engineering's best cost, the, their, their estimate of what that would cost to construct. So uh, I'll add to that. Uh, we did meet with the school district and uh, have already discussed where those 24 spaces would be going this year. Um, and the cost to construct those 24 spaces was the 100,000. Okay. It, it involved um, a small retaining wall, um, curb and gutter, and obviously the, the asphalt and striping to go along with that. Cool. And it doesn't, this doesn't mean that they don't need the spots. Uh, there's times in the year when they do. Um, the issue is right now is we're, we're trying to, we came to an agreement to try to reduce the cost to the city. Um, they certainly will need to construct them at some point in the future. Um, it may be, I, don't, I can't tell you what that would be, but um, they've decided to defer that until until the time that they, they, uh, they, tr that they it's a right. high demand. Right. So just, just for reference, next time Darren, you don't even have to. Yeah. No. It wasn't, no. Darren no. was here. No, no. Yeah. We cooperate. We are a good council. Yeah. We work in, we had a tie vote here, but I'm telling you, 410 is 410, and we got problems down that street. We need to look at the drainage. We need to look at curb and gutter. We need to look at certain things down that street. I'm not apologetic for anything, but I will work in good faith and harmony with the school and with the city. But I would appreciate that contracts are contracts. They're looked at, and $100,000 is a lot of money for 24 spaces. I don't care how you toss it, but I'd have to look at it. But I think it'll pass next time. So for the record, I will put this on the agenda for March 21st. Add it to the consent calendar for March 21st. Yes, sir. Thank, thank you. you. OK, thank you, council. We'll move on to public comment on items not on the agenda. I only have one signed up for six today, and that's Ann Esch. Would you like to come forward, Ann? Welcome. Ben, can you help with that, please? Oh, thank you. Thank you, Ben. My name is Ann Ash. I'm sorry, Ann. I'm going to have to ask you to speak up the best I'm you can. I'm still not very loud, am I? That's perfect. Is that right better? There. That's perfect. Okay. <laughs> uh, my husband and I live in the Trail Ridge Apartments. We've lived here for two years now, and we love Woodland Park. We were almost natives in Green Mountain Falls summers for over a hundred years, our families. <laughs> and uh, I'm close to that age, but not quite. But I just wanted to thank uh, Mayor Levy, uh, is it Darren Tangerman, Kip Wiley, and Ben Schmidt. And was some, did Mike come? No. But they came to our little Green Mountain Falls trustees meeting Tuesday night, after hours, 7 o'clock, to tell us about your roads and your flood control and all that you're doing here. And you know that Green Mountain Falls is a mess. We've just had an awful time. But I just wanted to thank you because it was so informative. And I'm so impressed with how many people come to your meetings at Green Mountain Falls. Well, the other thing is I represent Green Mountain Falls on the Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments Citizen Advisory Committee. And so your mayor is on the board of directors and Tyler Stevens 
is also from Green Mountain Falls. But, um, <coughs> excuse me, oddly enough and sadly enough, other than myself, no citizens came to our meeting. I was the citizen. <laughs> and I just think it's wonderful that your people come to support the work you're doing and to be inter interested. And uh, I just, I told Jason Wells and our mayor, uh, Jane, that I would like to come up here and say this, and they said, good, because they really appreciated it. And thank you very much. Thank you, Anna. Thank you very much. And to what you said, and, and I said it afterwards, and, and we're going to plan for it, uh, the presentation was so impressive to me, even though I have some sense of, of what we're doing, that I thought that uh, Ben and Kip would come to council and to the community to provide that same information for us. I think you'd all enjoy it, and a lot of you know some of the things that we've done, but it was a great presentation, and, and bottom line is Woodland Park is being as responsible as we possibly can uh, relative to those uh, downstream from us, and it's all because of these guys that are, that are sitting at the end of the table. So thanks again for a great job, and uh, we'll look forward in the next couple of months of having that presentation for us. Thanks, and thanks again, Ann. It's very nice of you to come and, and thank us. Okay, we will move on. Um, I'm sorry, if there's any other public comment on items not on the agenda. Okay, we have no unfinished business tonight, no ordinances on initial posting, and so we move to, you must be reading the agenda, Lord, uh, public hearings and agenda item 9A. Thank you very much. Council members use electronic devices to access the materials relevant to the public hearing before us. Be assured that it is the commonplace of the City Council that these devices are not being used for texting, emailing, or other communications during this public hearing. Floor, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mayor Levy. Tonight we are here for the temporary use permit for Movies Above the Clouds for 2019. Many of you have, may have gone to movies in the past. This year they are proposing movies to be projected on June 14th, July 12th, and August 9th. Tonight we are here to hear this uh, temporary use permit because we received a complaint on it last year for the August movie. So when we receive a complaint on temporary use permits, we do bring them before council for the final decision. Um, staff did review this application. We received the one complaint for the one movie in August. Um, our code enforcement officer did speak to the resident who complained and with a noise complaint, we recommend that they contact the police department and the police department will enforce a noise violation pursuant to our charter and our municipal code um, as a nuisance. Uh, in this case, this resident did not call the, the police department, instead came to our code enforcement officer um, and the code enforcement officer did communicate with the resident. They have been informed that in the future, they feel free to contact the police department as any, residents, any resident should for any noise complaint. Um, and then staff did a review of the um, proposed event with the projection system and, and how uh, the layout is. And just uh, does recommend approval for this year for the three dates they're proposing on Midland Pavilion with just some recommendations. So staff does recommend approval of Movie of Above the Clouds TUP for August 9th, July 12th, and June 14th, subject to four conditions, that the event coordinator be responsive to complaints received, if any. That's one of our standard TUP um, conditions. That the event coordinator continually evaluate and adjust as necessary the volume and the duration of sound emanating from the speakers to ensure that it's not excessive beyond Henrietta Street, which you can see is just to the north. <laughs> and that all speakers be downcast and should not project above the above should not project sound above the last row of the audience, and that the sound system be turned off at 10 o'clock p.m. We do have the event coordinator here with us tonight, Dustin Guthrie, who is running the event this year. If you have any questions on the sound system he's using, how high the speakers are, 
Uh, he will be monitoring Henrietta Street, walking up and down, checking the volume. Uh, you, we can certainly call him up. I think this question might answer it for everybody. How many years have we had this event? Since 24, er, 2014. So this will be the sixth year. This will be the sixth year. How many complaints have we had in six years? The first one. That's all I need to know. Noel? Um, how many other events do we have that, that have music? Um, we have quite a few. I just Yeah, um, music, I'd say <laughs> over, the, over the year we have four or five. Any complaints with those? No. Well? So uh, I read the packet, I believe, seven-tenths of a mile was where this complaint came from. That's an incredible distance from there. What, uh, I'm skeptical, let's put it that way. Um, what, what Ste skeptical of the complaint? Uh, yeah, seven-tenths of a mile is, you know, Empire Strikes Back at volume 12 or something. <laughs> I don't know. I, obviously, it was investigated. And I think it was a Star Wars movie. Well, well there you go. I, it's not really a question. I just kind of question that how would obviously the event coordinator would uh, be. Uh, I mean, Henrietta's what less than a tenth of a mile. So, no, um, I've been to this event. It, it is a great event. The kids are there. Everybody's having a great time. Um, one person complaining to me is, is, is it, that's the. That's how I see it. It's a great event. So thank you for putting it on. Anything? I'll put it in perspective. In all of 2018, for that address, that dispatch check, there were zero complaints. We called it this so this one event called in, that would have been the only complaint at that location. Anything else, Council? If not, call for a motion to approve the TUP. Thank you, Suzanne. Case? Yes. LeVar? Yes. Levy? Yes. Sonier? Yes. Sawyer? Yes. Carr? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries 6 0. Thank you, Suzanne. Mayor Levy, may I just say, Dustin, since you sat here for an hour and a half almost, did you want to come up and promote your event? so much. I appreciate the time. Um, we're excited. This is actually my second year overseeing and managing the event. It was handed off to me last year, and so we're really endeavoring to make it as good as it possibly can be for the families that come and attend, and we've had upwards of 300 to 400 people that attend the event, fill the whole green hill, um, and it's just a great time. We, we try to start the movie as soon as we possibly can to get it done as soon as we can, but with it being an outdoor uh, movie, the, the sunlight kind of plays, it makes it hard to see, so we we um, get it going and get it in and out of there as quick as we can. So we appreciate the, the uh, approval of that and allowing us to keep doing this event for the families. And just, again, we're trying to provide a, a great event, fun event that families can come out, parents can come out, and uh, just enjoy a night with free popcorn and, and a free movie. So I uh, would love for all you, everybody to come out. If, if everybody's welcome. It's the second Friday of, of all the summer months, and we'll be showing some family-friendly movies. We'll probably stay away from Star Wars this year uh, since it seemed to create a problem last year. So thank you so much, and I appreciate your time. Thank you, Dustin. Just keep the noise down over there, would you? Okay, Laura, we will move on. Item number 9B. Thank you, Mayor Levy. This is an application for a change in use zoning development permit submitted by Johnson & Associates Construction. Ms. Erin Obering is the property owner and is here tonight and will be making a small presentation. It is to allow for four residential dwelling units, two on each lot, in the Neighborhood Commercial Zone District on Lot 6 and 7 of Block 2, Aspenwood Subdivision. And of course, tonight is the City Council Public Hearing, March 7th, 2019. This is a brief, very um, large-scale location map showing the site of Lot 6 and 7. You can see it's pretty much in the east end of the downtown area of the City of Woodland Park. This is an aerial photo showing the two lots in red. Lot 6 is the one to the north. Lot 7 is the one immediately south of it. And you can see um, here is Rampart Range Road going north-south, Lake Avenue immediately uh, spurring off of Rampart Range Road, Baldwin Avenue coming up to join Rampart Range Road and then um, spurring off to the north, 
um, we can see Forest Edge Road here behind and Forest Edge Circle up to the north. So again, this is the site that we are discussing tonight. It is two lots. This is another aerial, and what this shows is some of the surrounding land uses of the site. So the site here is in this red rectangle. To the immediate south is Judd's Glass, a uh, uh, windshield repair studio. Uh, to the immediate north is Rampart Dental Medical Office, and then another medical office to the north. A small electrical um, uh, electronic repair service in this light industrial zone, uh, light industrial use, sorry. Dental office here to the northeast, warehouse and self storage warehouse to the east, Aspenwood condos immediately to the east and a little bit to the south, and then south of the site are storage offices, medical offices, and the city owns this little triangular piece right here, this little pork chop. Here is the Woodland Park High School and of course the Aquatic Center right down here. And everything else that's not labeled is pretty much single family residential. So that's the neighborhood we're in. This is a portion of our zoning map for the city of Woodland Park. The site is indicated by this red star right here. And you can see this light pink surrounding it is zoned neighborhood commercial. And the site itself is zoned neighborhood commercial. This brown area here is multifamily residential suburban. And this dark brown here are the condos, the townhomes, which is multifamily urban which is the higher density residential. The light, ag again, is the um, light yellow. The dark, deep yellow is the urban residential zone district, which is primarily single family residential, as is the light, pale yellow, which is suburban residential. This is the school property, which is uh, public, semi-public land, and the pink is the community commercial. So you can see that there is a mixture of all different types of residential, different densities, in different types of zone districts in this neighborhood. This is an aerial photo taken from Rampart Range looking straight north. You can see Rampart Range Road here and cars coming towards us. You can see the curb and gutter along the east edge of Rampart Range Road and the sidewalk. This is Judd's Glass, this gray building right here. This is the two lot empty site that we are discussing tonight. And this is the dental office just to the north. Um, this is a good photo that shows you some of the existing and surrounding architecture. You can see that most of the height of the surrounding commercial businesses are small, two stories primarily, and they look almost residential. It has a residential feel in this commercial zone. Electricity runs um, right along um, Rampart Range on the other side of the sidewalk, as you can see the overhead lines. This is looking straight into the vacant lot, and again, take a look at the architecture. These buildings don't look industrial for the most part. Um, th these are two lots here, and they will be built upon, and we'll show you the uh, architectural elevations in a, a future slide, and, and I would say that they match some of the architecture that you're looking at right here. And this is from Forest Edge Road from the east end of the lot. Again, these are the two vacant lots that we're discussing tonight. This is the back end of Judd's Glass, and this is the dental office to the north. Uh, one thing to note on this photo is the open drainage ditch along Forest Edge Road here. So this is a site plan showing some of the characteristics of the land. The black are the foot footprints of the building that is proposed to be built, and the dashed red line is the building envelope within the lot that the uh, footprint can fit into. So you can see it has an eight foot side setback on all sides of these two lots, 25 feet from Rampart Range Road and 25 feet from Forest Edge Road. And for the most part, the applicant has um, moved and located all of the buildings closer to the east end, closer to Forest Edge Road, so that his, um, so that the um, decks can maximize the view of Pikes Peak. This big blue arrow is essentially the slope. The high point on this site is 8,480 feet, roughly in this area, and it all drains and sheet flows down this way to a low, uh, six feet lower point of 8,474 feet. It's very flat, very developable, um, and highly accessible. What you see here is the water line coming up along Rampart Range Road, and the brown line is the sewer line coming up along Rampart Range Road. 
So this photo shows you some of the improvements that the applicant is proposing. Mm -hmm. For instance, they are looking at planting four street trees, pine trees, along Rampart Range Road. Again, the buildings are set back further towards <coughs> Forest Edge Road, and so the front will be grass. Um, they are looking at river rock along the side, which will also include the drainage swale to hel help with the drainage on the site, and some shrubs along the front, and a little grass uh, strip between each unit. Ultimately, the applicant is proposing to condominiumize these into four units that will then be individually sold. Um, right now, this is just two lots, and he's looking at two duplexes on, on each, so four units total. So this gives you an idea of what the applicant is proposing in, in, in terms of the site design. They're also looking at a six-foot privacy fence along the north boundary and along the south boundary. Um, the privacy fence will require um, a permit. This is the elevation, and if you can remember what some of the buildings in that area look like, this, I believe, would harmonize with a lot of the buildings you see there. It is two-story structures. Um, they are looking at a stucco exterior earth tone with some earth tone stone uh, finishing along the bottom the first floor. There'll be a wood pergola around the sides and they're looking at a wood deck and wood trim and it will be a bronze colored gable metal roof. So these are the elevations. Staff did a comp complete review and analysis of the application. We did a referral to the internal departments here within the city, the utilities, public works, the building department. We also sent it out to the Northeast Teller County Fire Protection District, to IREA, and to other utilities, and received no concerns related to this application for a change in use. We did uh, public notice of tonight's hearing. We sent out adjacent property owner letters to everyone within 150 feet. Um, we did, and actually more, we notified everyone within the condo units immediately to the east. We posted the site with a poster, and we did publish tonight's hearing in the Pikes Peak Courier. I wanted to remind you all that this is zoned eight, is neighborhood commercial zone, which is section 1820 of the municipal code. It has a whole slew of permitted uses, which I'm not going to read. This was in the um, staff report, but it can give you an idea of some of the uses. For instance, an art gallery could go on this site, for instance. But what's important here is that it does allow for residential uses up to two dwelling units per lot, which is what this applicant is proposing. It also allows for accessory dwelling units which is like a mother-in-law suite. There is a whole slew of conditional use permits, which again would require city council approval. For instance, a hospital could go on this site with city council approval. Some of the limitations within the neighborhood commercial zone district, for instance, it has a maximum height of 35 feet. This applicant is only proposing to build structures to about 26 feet high. So it is even lower than the maximum height. A commercial building could come in here and build to 35 feet, for instance. Setbacks, again, we discussed those earlier, 25 feet front and rear along the roads, eight feet on all sides. Frontage, it has an existing frontage of 50 feet, which complies with our minimum, 40 feet. There's enough parking on site to meet our parking regulations. There are three that the applicant is proposing, one inside the garage, two in the driveway. He's only required to show, or to have two on site parking spaces, so he has enough. Uh, fencing and shrubbery will require a fencing permit, and fencing can go up, just has to get a permit. Um, something about fencing, if it's an open fence, uh, like a post, a post, an open post fence, maximum height is three feet in the front setback. If it's a solid fence, six feet is the maximum height. Uh, signs, they could put a sign in there identifying a little um, neighborhood. If they wanted to, a sign permit is required for that. Sidewalk, they would have to provide a sidewalk or fees and loo along Forest Edge Road. And landscaping, the minimum 25% of the lot has to be landscaped, and we did see and glance at the landscaping that the applicant is proposing. So with this application, because it's a change in use, and in 2016, this council approved an ordinance that allowed for a change in use to allow for residential in commercial zones administratively. If we receive complaints, this new ordinance stated that then this application for a change in use has to come before council. And that's why we are here tonight. This application was uh, posted and many people came to look at the application and had concerns about it from the community. So it's these concerns that is the reason we're having this public hearing tonight. 
Um, staff did a full review of this application for a change in use, and the review standards are the conditional use permit standards, even though they're not applying for a conditional use permit. So the standards, there are 11 of them, and I'm very briefly going to highlight them. Um, is there a need for this use? Yes, there is a demand for residential use in the City of Woodland Park, and especially the City encourages mixed use within commercial zone districts, which was the whole impetus for the implementation of the 2016 ordinance. Is there any injury to public health and welfare? No, staff believes there's no injury if two, four units were built on this site. Will there be uh, injury to property values? No, staff does not believe that um, developing a vacant lot and the design of this proposed structure and the quality of this design, we believe will improve the value um, of the neighborhood. And the applicant further submitted a letter from a real estate broker stating the same thing, that there should be an increase in value, not a decrease in value. Um, does the proposed use and the design as submitted harmonize with the surrounding area? Staff believes it does, both in the architectural design and in the uses that the applicant is proposing. Um, one thing to note, uh, actually I'll get to that in the architectural design. Does the application comply with our city plans? Yes, staff does believe that the application complies with the 2010 comprehensive plan, all the goals, policies, objectives, and action items in that plan with respect to, again, mixed use development in the city. Does the application comply with city regulations? Yes, the application will, supply with our, uh, will comply with our building codes, will comply with our zoning codes, will comply with our setbacks and all of the requirements for the development of a single family, for single family units on this site. Is there any injury from traffic? Residential development will produce less traffic than if this were a commercial small office building, for instance. Each unit in a multifamily unit approximately produces seven and a half vehicle trips, average vehicle trips on a given day. A single family residence produces 10. An office building could produce 95 plus traffic. So the four units would reduce the traffic on the surrounding roads. Um, how is drainage handled? There will be no injury to drainage. Drainage will be handled with the submission of the zoning development permit and the building permit and development on the site. We saw how the land slopes and the applicant is proposing swales to catch it and curb it and bring it into the existing detention system and or uh, mitigate it on site. Um, and that will all be addressed with forthcoming zoning development permits and building permits. Um, how is water, sewer, wastewater being handled? We saw in the images earlier, there is water and sewer along Rampart Range. It's just a matter of connecting service lines and wastewater um, is the same. Drainage will be handled in the same way. Are there any hazards on the site? No, there are no environmental or any other hazards on this site. It is an extremely developable infill parcel that is available and accessible. And finally, architectural design. Again, staff believes that it's a high quality design. It will be um, in harmony with the surrounding ar architecture and the surrounding uses and will fit in with the neighborhood. So staff does recommend that city council approve, based on the findings contained in the staff report and as presented at the public hearing, the change in use zoning development permit 19001, granting up to two dwelling units per lot pursuant to section 1809090N7 on lot six and seven, block two of Aspenwood subdivision uh, on Forest Edge Road to be constructed in substantial compliance with the application as submitted. That does conclude my report. Mayor Levy, um, again, Erin Obering, who is the property owner, um, is here and I'd like to bring up her presentation and have her come up and then we can answer questions after that. Sounds great, thank you. Okay.
are proposing two units in each building. It'll be a mix of two and three bedroom units, all of which will be approximately 1,500 square feet and will include a one car garage. Um, when we began planning this project, we really focused on two things. We were focused on the design aesthetic and the accessibility. Um, from a design standpoint, we have incorporated stucco and stone so that we will harmonize with the adjacent area. We're also including metal roofs, which are very sustainable. Um, we've also included some interesting roof lines and windows to try and make sure that we did uh, reflect that mountain western theme that Woodland Park is so famous for. Um, on the landscaping front, we've included native and drought tolerant plantings. Uh, you'll also notice we also notice that there is the rock swales. Those do serve, tr serve two purposes. Um, it provides location for on-site snow storage. In addition, it will improve the water quality from the drainage and capture some of that drainage as well. Um, you'll also notice that we have two exterior parking spots along Forest Edge Road, along with the internal and the garage. Um, as Laura mentioned, we're required to have two spaces per unit. We did decide to move forward with three spaces to ensure that we had more than adequate parking for our residents. Um, as for the uh, accessibility, we were really excited about this location for a couple of reasons. We love the walkability of Woodland Park. I grew up here. I love this town. Um, and so we're really excited that you can walk to the aquatic center, to the schools, that it's got a lot of area uses and services that you can get to in the parks. Um, we were also really excited about the mixed use in this area. As you're, I'm sure, aware, we have um, adjacent high density multifamily. We have some commercial. We've got some single family, and then there's some low density multifamily right there as well. So we're excited and feel like this harmonizes well with this area, and it really does meet a need that Willem Park has determined exists with the residential units. Um, we also believe that these are an accessible price point for a lot of people. Obviously, Willem Park is a very popular town, and this will allow additional um, stock for those residents that. Um, we are excited. We believe that this development does align with the city's strategic plan, as Laura had mentioned, the 2010 comprehensive plan. We believe it, it uh, harmonizes well with the adjacent uses, and um, we have also believe that it will add value to our neighborhood. Happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much. <laughs> Council? No. I'd actually like to hear the concerns. I see uh, the audience. Like, it will be. You can do that. Thank you very much. Council? Anybody else like to speak first? Okay, we do have a couple people signed up. Um, and I'll just preface by saying this. I'll give you a couple, three minutes at the most. And if you follow one of the uh, participants, um, please don't duplicate what they say. Um, if you have new information, we'd love to have it. But I don't want to have a bunch of people coming up and saying exactly the same thing. So that said, we'll start with Brent Morrill. And if you'll just give us your name and address when you come to the podium and speak as loud as you can so everybody at home can hear you. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Um, appreciate your time. Um, I am Brent Morrill. I'm at 451 Rampart Range Road. I'm the dentist of the adjacent property. I chose dentistry because it's the farthest away from public speaking, and I don't have to wear a tie. So here I am doing both. Um, as, as many of you know, and Mayor Levy, especially you, you own a small business in town and um, big uh, business. That's, that's right, big <laughs> business. Uh, and I and I think you can empathize with the fact that small businesses can struggle in Woodland Park, um, whether they're commercial or family-owned, small family-owned. All these businesses that are around this this empty lot, there's 14 commercial um, properties there, and I, I will make a, a couple of corrections if I can from what Laura said, but. Um, across the street is also commercial. Um, she stated that it was uh, residential, but across the street there's two empty commercial lots as well. So there's 14 commercial lots. Um, also, all the businesses on, on our street are one story, not two story. Um, and there's 14 commercial lots and nine uh, active businesses going on there. And this proposed property for a residential building to go on is smack dab in the middle of all of this commercial property. It couldn't be any more in the middle of it. Um, so um, where we are located, all of us businesses, we are of course not on Highway 24 with high visibility. Um, because we're neighborhood commercial, we're restricted on our signage. It has to be close to our building. It has to be small. Um, this proposed uh, residential um, building in my aspect 
aspect of it will block a lot of my signage, especially with the trees and the six foot fence going around it. Um, my, my building will be very unvisible um, from people driving uh, north. Um, we rely almost every one of our businesses there, we rely mostly on word of mouth because of our location. Uh, we're not in a high visible area like many of the businesses on Highway 24. Um, so, um, the, the conditional use that Laura went through in the, on the uh, 11, I feel like there's a few of them that um, this won't meet with. Um, it says that the number one, the proposed development, you shall have a demonstrated direct need to be there. Um, I don't see that it needs a direct need to be there. In fact, Steve Johnson, um, I've talked to him on the phone a couple times, very nice, very polite. Um, but he did tell me that he's had another um, person approach him about buying a lot from him and putting a commercial business there, a daycare center, um, which I would much rather see go there than, than the, um, the residential buildings going on, mostly because of the density that's going on here. Um, if, if they were trying to build the same residential building on an urban residential lot, it wouldn't be possible. Um, because there's a 7,500 square foot restriction on that. This lot is only 7,000 square feet. If it was zoned a suburban residential, the requirement is 15,000 square feet. Again, they wouldn't be able to, to build on that. Um, so they're trying to take a, a unit and cram it into this, this small area that wouldn't be allowed anywhere else in the city, but yet we're proposing it be built here with even though it meets all the setbacks, it's still below the minimum of being able to build a residential lot anywhere else in the city. Um, um, under the, the neighborhood commercial um, district, it says any commercial building must be at least 15 feet from as any resident du dwelling. So why is this not imposed in the, in the reverse? Why can a residential building come next to a commercial building and be within eight feet when if you were going the other way it has to be 15 feet. Um, my parking lot will need to be used by the construction. Um, they already have been using my parking lot. Um, I have, they've been using my parking lot to pull in their drilling systems already. Uh, I would like to know what they're going to do to keep the construction off of my parking lot in order to build a building that's only eight feet. I don't see how that's possible. I built homes myself, but then in the construction business, I don't know how that's possible. Um, this is, these units are, are gonna be sold as, as condos, individual owners with no HOA. There's no regulations on what they can and can't do with their properties. Um, that would include them being able to have chickens. I don't see how chickens um, fit with the harmony, which is also one of the 11 rules um, within our, our area of being a lot. Um, if, it, if these were rentals instead of condos being bought, there's a little more regulation on that. I own rental homes myself. I can say no pets, no chickens, no, you know, I can say to upkeep the yard and mow the lawn and keep the shrubs and trees trimmed. There's no regulation on this. Um, parking, the entire length of the property will take up um, all of Forest Edge Road there. The entire length will take up Forest Edge because there'll be four driveways instead of a commercial business going in most likely there would be one driveway, it, even if any on Forest Edge Road. Forest Edge Road is used very much so as our commercial parking because we're not allowed to park on Rampart Road. So any time of the day you drive by there, there's many cars already parked there, which you can even see in the pictures that were presented. Um, I'll give you another minute. Okay. Uh, I think that water drainage will be an issue. It already is. Um, anytime there's a, a good rainstorm, especially in August or September, um, that ditch fills up completely. I'm constantly taking logs and debris off of my parking lot because the culverts that are already there existing that go under the road towards the high school parking lot is not sufficient to drain that, that ditch. Um, I know that Judd's Glass, they all also have logs and debris after these rainstorms. Adding four more culverts to this is just going to bottleneck it even more. Um, and it's a well-known financial strategy 
to buy a residential law on the fringe of commercial lots and rezoning it to, or buying a residential lot next to a commercial lot and rezoning it to commercial for instant equity. The reverse would be just the opposite. Turning a, a commercial lot into a residential, it would only decrease the value of these lots and, and the businesses around. Um, so I appreciate your time and consideration in this. This is something that um, I'm very much opposed to. Uh, I think it affects all of us businesses in, in a certain way, and uh, I feel like mine more so than any other. So I appreciate your time. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> Next is Chuck Thompson. Chuck Thompson, I was a dentist here for 30 years. In 1986, I had Rampart Family Dental Building built. At that time, Dr. Greger had his dental office, which is now a chiropractic office, at the north end of that block. No other lots were developed. I wanted to be next to Dr. Greger, so I bought the two lots that Rampart Dental is on. And the years go by, and Judd's Glass come along, and years go by, and nobody else came along. But I will say that back in 1986, had this fourplex of 26 feet high been there, I would not have purchased those lots. I would have looked somewhere else to build my dental office. Um, this sort of reminds me of uh, when I was in the Army for seven years. They gave me a combat boot that was size 9 for my size 10 foot. I said it wouldn't work. You're shoehorning me in. And they said, oh, it'll be okay. When I got blisters, they said, oh, we'll fix that. And they gave me the right size. If this goes through, there will not be a fix. It'll be permanent. And I ask the council to consider that, that this is shoehorning into this small space, the multifamily or <coughs> commercial situation that I don't think belongs in Woodland Park. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Doctor. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Okay, next, Susie, you don't want to speak? Okay. Um, then we'll move on, and I'm sorry if I mispronounced because I can't read very well. Rod, thank you. Your last name, sir? Thank you, Mr. Conroy. Start yeah. by giving us your name and address, please. I'm really hard here. I'm sorry. Could you start by giving us your name and address oh, for the sure. record? Yeah. My name's Rod Conroy. Um, I reside at 800 West Street here in Woodland. I also own Judge Glass. Thank you, sir. Okay, 401 North Rampart. And uh, uh, I'm here to, tonight to voice my concerns uh, regarding the proposal to change the commercial residence to occupancy at the property just north of Judd's Glass, officially described as Lot 6 and 7, Block 2, Aspen Woods Subdivision. Common sense tells me that the residential use of this property right next door to my building will become problematic. And the reason why is because um, since the proposed duplex condos will be within seven feet of my building and tall enough to be looking down on my building, think there, there may probably be an issue. Um, if you're not familiar with Judd's Glass, we are a very high energy glass shop <clears throat> with significant uh, noise level. And from, um, from the use of air compressors, impact drivers, fine knives, chop saws, and glass grinders. That's why I can't hear. Uh. Um, this noise level runs usually between eight and nine hours a day and sometimes even on the weekends. And uh, 
I can assure you any residential environment will not be happy with us. Uh, I know peace and quiet is, is um, uh, important to somebody who's, you know, at the residence and um, um, with these proposed condos, I don't think they're going to get it. And so, uh, and I think that's going to be a, a selling point problem also. Also, additional traffic at the lake and rampart intersection is another concern. It is already a heavily trafficked area due to the school traffic, Judd's cu customers coming in and out, glass delivery trucks, I mean, yesterday I had seven of them, as well as vans, our vans, and trucks coming and going. And, uh, um, and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. No one else signed up. If anybody else would like to speak right now, um, this would be the time. Okay, if not, we'll start with you, Noel, if you'd like. I'm going to hold off my comments and see what the other council members have to say. Sounds good. Council? I'll start. Um, Excuse me, Mary Lee, did we want to give the applicant an opportunity to rebut? We certainly can at some point. Is that usually what we We can do it now, sure. Do? If you'd like, go right ahead. I appreciate it. I'm going to address the comments in no particular order. Um, as for traffic, as Laura mentioned, the use that we're proposing does reduce traffic compared to a commercial use. Um, for the noise, the fencing is in response to the concern raised by the residents about the noise. Um, the intent is to put a three-foot fence in the 25-foot setbacks as is required and then a six foot privacy fence along the remainder. Um, and that is to really buffer those adjacent uses based on their concerns. And we've also used strategic landscaping and we've also made the decision prior to these concerns being raised to incorporate noise dampening um, construction materials, which is pretty common in most units like these, these days. Um, as for, we have not started construction on the site um, and all construction activity will be retained in the, within the site footprint that will not be an issue, I assure you. Um, as for the requirements of the code, we have met all requirements as they're laid out in the code today. I understand if someone would like to change those codes, um, but I don't know that that's, this is the format to do that in which um, we have met all requirements that are outlined. Um, and then the other um, comment that I had is the concern about us putting our driveways along Forest Edge Road. It was the fire chief's request that we do utilize Forest Edge Road. In addition, there's a lot of foot traffic along the sidewalk on Rampart Range, and it's a busy street. So we would not put ingress egress on these lots off Rampart Range Road, regardless. So either way, those driveways are going to be Sounds good. You might just stay close by. Okay. We might have a question for you, Aaron. We'll see. No, we're going to give it back to you because you're the one that wants to speak. If not, we'll call for a motion. Because I don't have anybody else raising their hand yet. I guess I am. Let's go. We might have one after you, but go ahead. One second. One second. Um, yeah, you can speak. Uh, Thank you, sir. Mayor? Yes, ma'am. We need to close the public hearing. Thank you. <clears throat> if nobody else would like to speak, or let me put it this way, would anybody else like to speak? Come right this way, young man. My name is Richard Dean. I own the Stampede building. My only 
question is, they're trying to change the zoning on this? No. They're trying to get it to a residential lot, right? We're changing the use. We're not changing the zoning. It's still going to be neighborhood commercial. That's correct. And then the, the flood, everybody that, that's been on the street, uh, Forest Edge Road floods when it rains. The, there's no way you can control that. I've got a covert between me and the doctor. Uh, nothing plugs up and it just floods the whole street here. And we're out there every um, fall picking up all the branches and stuff to get up to get the stuff out of there. I don't know. I, I just, I just, I disagree with putting residential right in the middle of the commercial buildings. And there's 14 commercial buildings right there. And there's also multi-level, there's multi-use, there's, there's apartments there, there's houses right behind, so there's uh, a number of uses right in that neighborhood, as was pointed out by Lore. So it's not the only, it's not the only one of its kind um, in that piece of property it is, but just remember, it's just a reuse, it's not a change in zone. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay, Noel. I'm sorry, I'll close the public hearing to public comment and go to council. Uh, this is a tough one for me because I, I do feel you're trying to squeeze a huge, couple huge buildings into a place that just doesn't seem right. Um, eight feet between Joe's glass and that one just seems like, um, it's like a big city lot where we have houses on top of houses. Woodland Park's known is being spread out. There's plenty of space between the businesses and the houses. First, I thought it would be okay, and then I saw the, the height of it. I know all the buildings around there are two, are one story, except for the Stampede, which is two stories. And then behind it, you have the apartment complexes, which are two stories. Um, the concern would be that Judge Jody's glass or something, it's going to burn down your stuff. If your gets on fire, it's going to burn down the judge's glass. I can see two buildings on there, but not four. So that, that's where I stand. I can see you building two, it would look great. But four just seems like you're cramping it in and trying to get as much space out of it. So would you rather have a commercial building 35 feet tall with the same... Um, same distance between buildings and, and possibly 10 times as much traffic because that's a possibility if a commercial building goes in there. Uh, I'm with you. That's why I'm torn about this. Uh, well, I'm just asking. The, yeah. uh, I understand the what ifs. Yeah. That's kind of what you're asking. Two right? sides, right? Uh, this property's been vacant since I've been here since 2000. So it could probably be vacant for another 19 years. Probably not. I don't know. You're right. The what ifs are, are hard to say. I just, I think two big buildings right there are just going to get Well, um, I'm going to vote no on this because I'm going to support the commercial uh, uh, character of this, uh, uh, this location. I drive by there five, six times a day. Well, it has to be an even number, I guess. But, um, the, uh, there, there's plenty of other places for residential. Um, I live very close to there, as you can imagine, because of my trip uh, characterization. Um, but uh, I w I'm going to hopefully keep it uh, in the commercial a aspect if possible, but that's just my one two cents worth. Thank you. Anyone else like I'll to chime weigh in? in. So I, um, First of all, everybody that spoke, you did a really good job. So for being nervous and not used to it, you did great. And I appreciate that you took the time to come here today. Um, from my standpoint, it was a vacant lot. It's private property. Somebody owns it. You know at some point somebody's going to put something on it. It happened in my neighborhood. I got a huge nursing home put right in front of my house. I have another vacant spot to the other side of my house. I have no idea what's going to be put in there. It could be a gas station. It could be an Applebee's. I 
wish it was going to be townhomes so that it would at least fit in with the neighborhood. So I understand your concern about the residential not necessarily fitting in, but we're not changing the zoning. And at some point, you know, something was going to go in there. So I get a little frustrated with the argument of, but it was a vacant lot and that's why I bought it. But it was a vacant lot that was owned by someone that at some point in the future, unbeknownst to anyone, something could be built there. So, and it could be, gosh, there was like a list of at least 32 other things that could go in there from nursing homes to gas stations to art galleries. So I would say you're lucky that it was going to be residential because it does cut down on the traffic, the parking lots, and the amount of people that would be coming and going. But I do understand your concerns and I do take them to heart. However, this use is allowed, and that's where I stand. Thank you. Noel? Just to clarify, we're taking one lot and dividing it into two lots. No, correct? sir. No. It's no. two existing no. lots. Two, two existing two lots, lots already. Six and seven. Two units. Oh. And just real quick, uh, I'd like to address the chicken issue. They live, it's in the city boundaries, so no chickens are allowed anyways. Because it's a town home, I'm sure there probably will be some type of HOA because the owners have shared roof lines, so there's going to be different types of rules and regulations that will be put in for maintenance and other rules because they're not individual homes. That would be different than an individual residence being built. So, Kelly? I just wanted to, to say also that this is a permitted conditional use based on our code. And she, they have met the, the criteria. Um, although I agree with Hillary, everyone's comments were very well stated and very um, informational, and I appreciate those. Um, but it is a permitted conditional use, and it is a private property, and we have to respect those private property rights. And so. Anyway, um, so I just have to point that out that um, I feel like um, our hands, I mean, we, are, we are following the rules, and, um, although I do appreciate the comments. Well, maybe the HOA won't allow chickens, so, <laughs> or goats. And HOA. also, for if the parking lot HOA. issue, if anyone's using your parking lot, that's your private property. So you have a right to ask them to get off of your property and not allow the use whatsoever. So and I know it's tough in a commercial lot because you don't know whether they're coming to visit you or not, but nobody needs to use your lot to do this project. And you have the right to keep them out of there. You can't, can't communicate from the audience. Paul, do you have anything? Yeah, I'm, I'm not for the project. I hear the businesses, I hear the owners. I'm particularly swayed by the reversal with the eight foot, six foot off a of judge. Uh, the fence does hinder the uh, signage, which is small. The noise is another consideration. The warehouse uh, traffic and trucks that go in, delivering cargo and picking up cargo, is also a concern. The flooding is really a concern, a big concern, which should be corrected, regardless if this project goes or not. There should be improvements made along that uh, area. That's my opinion. Can I comment on the flooding? Please do. Um, debris always comes and goes in rain events. Um, ditches are a place where people love to throw their yard waste to include branches, debris. I uh, thank you for bringing that to our attention. We'll do our best to clear those. Um, but when culverts do get plugged, the water finds a way around them. And we're going to do our best to clear those up um, and utilize the drainage system that's there. Yes, sir. I'd like to just make one comment. Please do. I just would also like to remind folks that in a commercial use, typically there is more impervious service created with parking lots and required parking. And so a commercial use on those lots would create service 
residential use will create less impervious surface. So there will be less runoff associated with rain events. So I just want to point that out, point that out as well. Thank you, Mr. Reed. Thank you. Council, anything else before we go to vote? I'll just say one thing about uh, three or four months ago. Um, you talk about highest and best use. Um, across the street from me at the Swiss Chalet, I'm going to get about a $6 million storage unit facility. Um, trust me, it's not what I had envisioned being on the street across from me. But this is what private enterprise drives. And um, I'm, a big, I'm a big believer in our economic system. Um, this piece of land has been vacant forever. Um, we need more housing in our community. Um, and I think there's always going to be some downside um, with anything that's built. There's always upsides and downsides. And that's, that's, our, that's our purview to decide if it's, if it's right or wrong. Um, so it's a d difficult decision for me too, but um, I'm going to vote in favor and uh, we'll see what happens. But um, again, to just tag on to what the rest of the council has said, um, great discussion, really appreciate your input, and um, we'll see what happens next. Thank you very much for your information, and uh, we'll move forward. Council, um, this discussion is complete. I'm looking for a motion to approve item number 9B. As stated on the agenda this evening, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. And a second. Suzanne. Thank you. Labar? Yes. Levy? Yes. Sonier? No. Sawyer? No. Carr? No. Ace? Yes. Thank you. Ty? 3-3. Three, three. Carried to the next meeting. Thank you very much. Um, for those that are present here, um, because Ms. Harvey will probably be at the next meeting, um, what's the process going to be? What's that going to look like? Do we have to, uh, will we hear the whole presentation again? Is it part of it? Yes. yes. Okay. Terrific. And just so everyone here knows, yeah, there'll be a public hearing again. So doctors, um, you know, everybody that, that weighed in. Um, please, uh, please come back and voice your concerns, and we're going to try to do the best we can to make the right decision. So thank you all for being here. Great conversation, and uh, that's what I love about our community is this, this is who we are. So thank you. Okay, we will move on to agenda item 9C, and Mike Farina? No. Here, I'll be handling that. Okay, thank you. Um, good evening, Mayor and Council. I'll be pinch hitting for Mr. Farina this evening on Ordinance 1341. It is a request to adjust expenditure appropriations to the various funds. Uh, essentially, it's to provide money for your police department to help find Kelsey Barrett's remains at the Midway landfill. Uh, it's coming from two funding sources. Uh, one source is the uh, overage that is projected by Mr. Farina of about $40,000 uh, in our 2018 budget. The other form of revenue is from the El Paso Teller 91 dispatch funds. I was able to lobby the board to provide an additional $5,000 per dispatcher uh, that was approved after our budget had been set. Uh, so that's an additional $40,000 that was unanticipated revenue that the city will have to offset uh, these expenditures for this search. So the $80,000 that's needed for the search will not affect our budget? Correct. Council questions? Well, I have a comment, although Mike's not here. Um, it looks to me like we're down to about 13% on our 2019 reserve. Um, just FYI. Um, we're not down to. We haven't reached anything yet. No, that, that's, that's the where projection, we're at. projection yeah. Mr. Fry, I would just bring your attention that we do have sources of funding for this appropriation that it should be uh, reserve neutral. 
and I'm as sensitive to that as you are. Thank you. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm not arguing against this at all. I'm okay. just trying to point out that other things might come up that we might want to consider. Well, and I, I would take this opportunity to, to use this as an example, and I know I've, I've shared a message with the council that um, this is a perfect example of something that comes up that we can't look for reimbursement for, typically, that we always need to have a good, healthy reserve for, because these are unforeseen things. So, and I've been asked many times to give an example of what that might be, so here is your example. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Motion, uh, motion then to approve ordinance number 1341. So moved. Second. Suzanne. Thank you. Labar? Yes. Levy? Yes. Sonier? Yes. Sawyer? Yes. Carr? Yes. Case? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries 6 0. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Suzanne. And Chief, thanks for all the work. Thank you. It's the officers are out there working and they're they're doing the best they can as quick as they can to try to, to get through this the partnership between our community uh, Teller County El Paso County CBI FBI is yeah. is exceptional and so thanks to to all of you be sure and let everybody else know that we're very very appreciative especially the workers which I'll get to say tomorrow when I'm down there absolutely and just so you know we, I put out an all call to all the sheriff or all of the Police chiefs in Colorado, and we have organizations from all over the state that are bringing in their employees, and some are even housing their employees on their dime to help us with this search. So we have got tremendous support assisting us on top of the Salvation Army that's been out for the last two weeks feeding the people that are on the line. So a lot of great support. Um, we're doing Thank the best we can to, to spend the money as, as wisely as we can. Thanks very much. Okay, we'll move on. And uh, Kip Wiley, Ordinance 1342. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I'll try to follow Miles. Uh, well, can we do a vote on that one? Oh, sorry. I missed that part. Um, I'll try to follow suit then. <laughs> I guess I was trying to plan out my game plan on my presentation. Um, Ordinance 1342 is the authorizing of the Twin Lakes water purchases of 5.3 Twin Lakes shares. Um, I'm happy to present to you that we have um, in front of you tonight six contracts for the mayor to sign. Uh, for those shares. So thanks to our quick action and your quick action, um, we we're, were able to make this happen. Um, the, these Twin Lakes shares are very valuable as, you, as you're aware, and uh, they don't further expand our population, they just further secure our water supply. Um, with uh, this ordinance in front of you, after I recommend approval after the public hearing of Ordinance 1342 to execute uh, the water purchase of these Twin Lakes shares uh, with the following six entities. Answer any questions. Thanks, Kip. Council, we had a pretty good discussion last time about this. If there are no questions. We'll call for a motion to approve Ordinance 1342. Yeah, we should have a public hearing since we're in public hearing. Would anybody like to speak on anyone's behalf relative to this ordinance? If not, the public hearing is closed and call for a motion. Thank you. Thank you. Suzanne? Levy? Yes. Soinier? Yes. Sawyer? Yes. Carr? Yes. Case? Yes. Labar? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries 6 0. Thanks, Thank you, Thanks, Kip. Great job. We always need the water. Okay, we have no new business tonight, so I'll move on to reports. I just have a couple of announcements to make. Um, Friday, March 15th. That's uh, a week from tomorrow will be the Chamber Annual Dinner at the Cheyenne Mountain Resort. Um, also, Cheyenne, also, excuse me, also Friday, March 15th at 2.15 at the Woodland Park High School. Uh, Tony Dungy is going to come and speak. Um, he's going to be in town as a result of the, the men's retreat at Curis Bible College. And I spoke with him last year. I had a chance to talk with him. Tony Dungy, for those who don't know, is a uh, retired NFL Hall of Fame coach and player, and um, he brings a tremendous message for our kids. Um, we've had uh, any number of issues in our community, some relative to suicide. Uh, Mr. Dungy lost uh, 
son of his to suicide. Um, and so uh, we just think it's a great resource. Mr. Wolf uh, agreed with me, and so we're going to have a we're going to have a, a school-wide assembly, and um, there are opportunities if we have room for some of the public to attend. Um, and so about two o'clock a week from tomorrow at the high school. Uh, the day following Saturday, March 16th, will be the second annual Woodland Park St. Patty's Day Parade and Pub Food Crawl. That starts at 12 o'clock. Okay, and then Tuesday, March 19th, 5.30 to 7, Chamber Business After Hours this month hosted by Keller Williams Realty and the Insurance Center. Yes. That's all I have. You know something about Keller Williams, so I do you. Good. Thank you. Good Val. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Appreciate it. Um, I, I want to mention I'm on Keep Woodland Park Beautiful. Uh, we're plugging away at our uh, various projects. Uh, Laura Pellegrino has been crucial as the city liaison in helping us uh, keep organized, uh, helping us with the minutes, and uh, keeping a very professional environment in those meetings. And I, she's not here anymore, but whatever. She's, she does a very good job. Uh, we're we're going through some uh, reorganization and people are coming and going and things like that, but we're still on target to do the cleanups and things and things of that nature. But I wanted to thank Lore in her absence. I'm sorry uh, for helping us out. Thank you, sir. Kelly. Um, I just wanted to again invite people to the business after hours at Kelly Williams. We're going to have a speakeasy theme, so. We look forward to seeing everyone there. I wanted to report to you about the DDA um, meeting this last Tuesday, and that the highlights I think are we're going to be having a retreat sometime in April, and that date will be coming. Also, wanted to say that the, the, we've had a conversation, and hopefully, we'll talk about it more in the retreat about focusing on the whole district and the needs in the whole district in the downtown area and looking at some possibilities for that. And then also there, the, Ms. Mary Jo Larson and some of the other folks, I'm sure that Mr. Carr will be involved, are looking at holding some bull, buck and bull rides on maybe a couple Friday nights uh, in either June or July. More information to come on that. So there's some activity and conversation, um, some creativity going on with the DDA, so look for more information to come. They are rekindling the newsletter, which we're hoping to see in the Mountain Jack Park again, and will be available on our website in different ways of getting that out to the community. So just a little update from the DDA. Mr. Mayor, thank, thank you. you. Kelly. Hillary. Thanks for having your voice back. Yeah, it's nice. <laughs> uh, welcome to the circus, Jason. <laughs> so we're glad to have you. Um, uh, the business after hours is going to be a speakeasy theme, so that'll be fun. And I got the privilege of attending one of the Citizens Academies last week, and uh, it was great. So I just want to say thank you to everyone involved in the city who's been putting it on, and, and Darren for coming up and stepping up and doing it. Uh, it was really informative, and I think that all of the academies that you've held so far have been, and I'm really glad that citizens are participating, and I wish that more would. So with who's left in the audience, if you'd recommend to your friends to apply for next year, it would really be great. Uh, it's great to have positive interaction and involvement with the citizens, because a lot of times we just get to hear the negative. So it's good to have the positive, and I'm really glad you guys are doing that. So, and that's all I have. Thanks. Thank you. Sold out performance, correct? Darren, excellent. Paul. Oh. Yes, I. I really would like to thank the uh, American Legion and the Veterans of Foreign Wars for their contributions to the city. What a great honor for them to be involved in our community and in Teller County. They do a lot of work for a lot of veterans and even for citizens. And I deeply appreciate what they did. I also like to
to thank the people who have come tonight and listened to us, the city for all the work that they do in putting the work together so that we could review it and vote on it. And to those who are at home who stay up this late, have a good night. <laughs> no. Um, I would actually like to thank the council tonight for having a, having open discussions on everything we've asked today or tied on. Because it allows the community to know what we're thinking. It allows the community to not guess at what we're thinking. And so the more discussion we have, more transparency we have. And that way people can go, oh, that's why they made the decision they made. So I know the councils drag longer, but in the long scheme of things, it's better that we talk it out. So thank you. Thanks, Noel. Anything else, Council? No? I'll turn it over to our brand spanking new four-day-old city attorney. <laughs> So, uh, not much to report in the four days that I've been here, uh, although I am, I'm extremely excited. I know I have big shoes to fill, as small as Erin was. She's uh, a giant in a, the industry of, of municipal attorney, so I know I've got a lot of, of work to do, and I'm excited to do that, and tonight was a great experience to learn a lot more about how Woodland Park differs from other places, so I'll hopefully get up to speed on the nuances on how things are but uh, I'm excited and looking forward to a lot of fun years and opportunities. Thanks, Chase. We're Welcome. excited to have you. We're thrilled to have you. Darren. Uh, I just want to touch on one issue before I hand it off over to, uh, to Ben for a snowplow update. But I wanted to update. Uh, we did talk about the strategic plan. I, uh, what I wanted to follow up with is I will get that out to you, the proposal. Um, tonight, and I meet with the facilitator on the 14th. So, if I could get city council's feedback on that proposal prior to then, I would appreciate it. Ben? All right, thank you guys for sticking with me. I'm gonna inject some fun into the night with our <laughs> snowplow update. Uh, in the interest of uh, Darren's push for outreach to the citizens with programs like the Citizens Academy going to Green Mountain Falls, I uh, just wanted to try to share more of the insight as to what we do in the city. So just to go through our order of operations again, for anybody that's kind of confused on, on how we prioritize the city, we do bus routes and sidewalks to area schools first, then we do primary roads and primary parking areas, then we do all the secondary roads, um, and that means going in and out, and then we come back with a smaller vehicle and do alleyways and cul-de-sacs because we want to make sure we get as much of the city open as possible. And then the following day, or, or later that day if, if we have time, we uh, continue sanding, we widen the streets as the, the snow starts to melt. We start what's called slushing and getting rid of all that excess uh, slush on the road that can turn to ice. So. Uh, one other thing I wanted to point out, because a lot of people, when they see that there's snow falling, they get concerned that the plows aren't out, but we do the full crew call out when there's four inches of snow. And the reason behind that is we have an on-call operator that's out all the time hitting the, the particularly bad spots within the city with the sander. And then uh, if we have the full crew out with those big trucks, you can actually uh, cause more damage uh, by plowing and turning the, the roads into ice if there's less snow. So just to reach out to the citizens, I uh, just wanted to let everybody know that it's, a, it's always a partnership, but uh, just to remind people that we do not want to throw our snow into the streets from your driveway um, because the snow has to go somewhere and it's going to go right back onto the driveway as those big plows come by. Uh, our crews are very, very cognizant of trying to help citizens out. Um, and turn the blades, but if you can imagine, I mean, these trucks are massive, and I would invite you guys or anybody to uh, go out with the crews sometime and see how quick they would have to turn these big blades to get every single uh, driveway clear, and it's, it's impossible. You, you're going to create windrows when you're plowing snow, and they're trying to do the absolute best they can, try to help everybody <coughs> out, but uh, just wanted to remind people not to throw their snow into the street. 
So if you want to help us out, you can move the vehicles from the roadway the night before the storm. Uh, I had a good call from one of the residents who went down his entire block and asked all his neighbors to move the street. And he calls us. He says, hey, man, can you come help me out? We, uh, we just would like to get our street cleared before this all turns to ice. And we said, sure, absolutely. And we send uh, one of our drivers out to help clear it. So that type of citizen in involvement is really good. Um, we also want to uh, make sure you give the, the plows burst. You know, they're big machines, and they, the, our operators are amazing. But uh, we, need, we want to stay back and make sure that we give them plenty of room to operate. Uh, remind your children not to play in the street. My son is always excited about playing in the snow and can't have him play in the, in the berms. And then just understand that uh, windrows, those berms that form at the edge of your driveway, are a, a big part of snow plowing. And that's, that's kind of an unavoidable thing. So just wanted to also follow up a little bit of humor. Um, when we, uh, after all the snow is gone, you guys will notice that there's a lot of uh, salt sand on the streets. This is really important that we clean this up so you'll see our sweeper out there uh, trying to keep all the storm drains and inlets clear. We can also do our part as citizens by not throwing trash in the street or throwing other things that might potentially clog those inlets because if the inlets don't work, that water has nowhere to go. And so our crews do a really good job of cleaning the inlets of ice, uh, making sure that everything can drain properly and uh, cleaning ditches. So we've also gotten a couple of calls about seeing our crews out, cleaning some of the saplings out of the ditches. Uh, the saplings love to grow in those ditches, but that is, uh, it blocks all the flow there. So we wanna make sure that we're keeping all those drainage ways really clean and flowing effectively. So if you see crews out there uh, doing minor tree work and uh, redoing some of that ditch work, that's, that's what they're trying to do is make sure that the city flows correctly. You guys have any questions for me? Did you grow a mustache for that picture? <laughs> I did, yeah. <laughs> Anybody? Paul. Absolutely. Thank you for bringing that. Yep. Thank you for bringing that to our concern, and I'll talk with the crew chiefs about that. See if we can come up with a plan to make sure we get a little more sand on there. And if you guys could just remind the businesses, if you see the owners, to tell them to make sure they don't push in the road. Council, anything else? Folks, thank you all for being here. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>